The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 10404 in the name of Alex Neil on dog attack figures. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Alex Neil to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Neil. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. In moving this motion on dog attack figures in my name, I would like to make mention of four organisations that have brought this subject uh, back to our attention and who have run a magnificent campaign on the need for us to review the Control of Dogs Act 2010. Uh, those organisations are, first of all, Radio Clyde, who have run the Lead the Way campaign uh, to protect children from dog attacks, led by Natalie Crawford. And the Radio Clyde has given already a lot of airtime to this subject and elicited a lot of additional information we weren't aware of. Secondly, once again, as with the original legislation, many thanks so far to the Scottish Society for the Protection of Animals, and in particular the role played by Mike Flynn. Thirdly, the Communication Workers' Union, who have been running a very substantial campaign across the United Kingdom on this very subject uh, to protect their own workers and their own members, led by Dave Joyce. And finally, and most importantly, to the victims and the families of people who have been the subject of dog bites and dog attacks down the years. Presenting officer, it's necessary to reopen this debate for three fundamental reasons. First of all, the problem of dog bites and dog attacks is still not only with us, but is actually getting worse. When you look at the NHS Health, NHS Health Board figures that are available, and there's only seven of the territorial, of the 14 territorial boards been able to provide us with figures, but even amongst those seven boards that cover half of Scotland, if you look at the number of attacks uh, for the latest figures, it is running at a rate of well over 4,000 attacks a year. And that is up from uh, 1,900 attacks in 2015 uh, in Greater Glasgow, for example, uh, to 2002, uh, 2027 and 2016. So the number is high and rising. Uh, secondly, if you look at the number of dog control notices that have been issued under the two 2010 Act, that accounts for 290 of the incidents. So that is much less than even 10% of all the incidents are leading to dog control notices. And that shows that the Act is not being implemented properly, which is the second issue. For example, if you look at enforcement and look at the number of animal control wardens, the biggest uh, local authority in Scotland, Glasgow City Council, has one animal control warden for a population of nearly 600,000 people. Meanwhile, a council like Renfrewshire, which has got a population of 175,000 people, have got two control wardens. And if you look at some of the other figures, for example, in Dundee, uh, which is another city afflicted by this problem, Nine in ten dangerous dog reports in Dundee go unpunished. So not only is the problem bad and rising, getting worse, but the implementation of the 2010 Act is very variable indeed from local authority to local authority. And that isn't good enough because whether you're attacked by a dog in Dundee, Glasgow or Renfrewshire or anywhere else shouldn't matter if you're attacked by a dog, then appropriate action should be taken and appropriate action by the local authority under this legislation is particularly important. And the third issue is that many of the powers at the moment are quite frankly not powerful, in, many of the measures are not powerful enough. Now, the reason why we needed the 2010 Act was because the 1991 Act introduced at Westminster concentrated on the breed of dog, dog, not the deed. And one of the objectives of the 2010 Act was to ensure that irrespective of the breed, if the deed was antisocial and threatening people, uh, not only children, but people delivering mail, uh, people working in parks and elsewhere, uh, it's the deed that matters more than the breed. 
because even those breeds not listed in the 91 Act are as capable of doing as much damage to human tissue as any of the breeds actually listed in the Act. So the three problems are the problems getting worse, uh, the, the measures that exist in the statute book, book are not being properly implemented, and the powers that are available, particularly to the police, aren't sufficient. And one of, one of the deficiencies is, under the current legislation, Basically, a dog is entitled to one bite before it's punished. And very often, it's the first bite that should be punished because it's the first bite, very often, that leads to so much damage, for example, to children. And it's not just about attacks on humans. There is a wider problem about attacks on farm animals, attacks of dogs on dogs, as well as attacks on human beings. But obviously my primary concern in this debate is with human beings. And let me quote from the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, a leading plastic surgeon, Dr. Judy Evans. She says the emotional trauma can be so difficult to deal with because it's ongoing. They, ha they have to deal with the trauma of the attack and of the constant operations to repair the damage. She says, I have seen young children who have had massive bite marks and scarring to their face and have seen tearing of the flesh. It can be so tricky to repair this sort of damage. There's also a massive risk of infection because of the nature of the injury. If you listen to the Royal Mail and Communications Workers Union, uh, which officially backs the Radio Clyde Lead the Way campaign, they've recorded 231 attacks on their employees alone in 2017, and they desperately feel the need for additional measures. Uh, as I said earlier, um, the uh, uh, importance of this legislation cannot be overestimated. We therefore need a fundamental review of the operation of current legislation, particularly but not only the 2010 Act. And we also need to identify where additional measures are required, number one, to ensure enforcement of existing and future provisions, as well as to give additional powers to the authorities where they are necessary. This is a very, very important debate, presiding officer, and it represents the views and the need for us to speak out on behalf of all those who are threatened by dog attacks or who have been the victims of dog attacks because sometimes the threat can be as damaging to the psyche, particularly of children, as an actual attack itself. So I hope that members will agree with me on the need for action, and I hope when the minister sums up, she will give a favourable response to the need for us to look at this issue again and ensure that more robust action is taken by this parliament to protect our people from dogs that are out of control. Uh, we move to the open debate, and can I say that there are many people who wish to speak in this debate, so strict timings of absolutely no more than four minutes per contribution, please. And I call Christine Graham, followed by Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I congratulate Alec Neil on securing this debate, as I was the member in charge of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010, a piece of legislation where the heavy lifting was done by Alec Neil, who passed the bill to me on his elevation to the front bench. He may, he may yet return, who knows? Of itself, it's legislation which was urgently required for three reasons. Firstly, because of the highly flawed Dangerous Dogs Act referred to by my colleague, an act to prohibit persons from having in their possession or custody dogs belonging to types bred for fighting, in other words, the breed. And secondly, it applied only in public places. Section 10 of the Neil Graham Control, I think I'll call it the Graham Neil Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010, amended the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991 by extending the offence contained in section three of that act so that it became a criminal offence to allow any dog to be dangerously out of control in any place, that is, private or public. Indeed, many attacks take place within the home or gardens that were taking place in private. Secondly, as uh, Alec Neal has said, it applied to deed not breed, that is, the owner or the person in charge of the dog. 
Thirdly, the Control of Dogs Act applied before a dog becomes dangerous, when it puts someone or another animal in a state of alarm or apprehensiveness, with a, do a dog control notice being issued if necessary. And those have been on the increase, or recognised the numbers quoted, but there have been previously warnings, perhaps, to owners, which are also recorded preceding any dog control notice. But, and it's a big but, to be effective, A, the public have to know that this is the law. B, there have to be enough local authority dog wardens or environmental wardens to um, implement it. And C, these personnel should be trained in dog behaviour. With hand on heart, I have to say that the legislation has been failed in all three counts. The public at large have no idea of this legislation. I met farming journalists recently who were lobbying me on the increase in sheep worrying and they'd never heard of the legislation. I know that there are few, few dog wardens employed across local authorities, some quoted by my colleague. And of course, I suspect very few have been trained in accordance with the government guidance about dog control. It's all very disappointing to say the least, and I would submit contributing to these worrying figures. So I welcome post-legislative scrutiny and review, and in particular, the activities of local authorities. I have to say, I'm also asking the corporate body if funding could be provided once a member's bill has been passed by Parliament to publicise it, as the government cannot. So the member may bring forward legislation with the wholehearted support of this chamber, but they have no funding to publicise it unless they plunder their various office costs. And I believe that's part of the problem. After all, everyone knows about minimum unit pricing, everybody knows about the ban on smoking, but they don't know about the Control of Dogs Scotland Act. But I say I'm also bringing forward a bill, now out for consultation, on responsible dog ownership, which I also hope will lead to a decrease in out-of-control dogs, many of whom are like that because they're with the wrong people, wrongly handed, and quite often simply lack exercise. After all, the key thing here, we must all remember, it's the deed, not the breed. And therefore, I welcome review, in particular, enforcement by local authorities and publicising this legislation to see if that will take us further. And I thank the member again for bringing forward this debate. I have Finlay Carson, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As my party spokesman on animal welfare, I would like to congratulate Alec Neil for bringing this very important and topical debate to the Chamber this evening. One of the oldest phrases is, dogs are a man's best friend, with the first recording of this cliche said to date back to Prussian times. However, from the figures that Alec Neil has highlighted, as well as the figures from the Communications Workers Union briefing, who represent the largest number of victims of dog attacks in Scotland and across the United Kingdom, dogs are sadly increasingly becoming something other than our best friends. While the Control of Dog Act passed in 2010 was an important piece of legislation, it is clear now that with the increasing number of workers and individuals, and indeed sheep and other animals attacked by dogs, this law has not been effective in bringing about more responsible dog ownership. I would like to raise a case from my own area of Dumfries from last year, which was truly shocking and resulted in a jail sentence being handed down. Two Dumfries women aged 73 and 62 were bitten by a Staffordshire uh, cross terrier while visiting their chemist. And two days later, the same dog bit a policeman. All three required medical attention. In this case, the owner was found guilty after admitting the dog was out of control. But this outcome is not always the case when it comes to applying the law on dangerous dogs in Scotland. Legislation currently requires proof that the person in charge of the dog believes it could attack a person and that corroborating evidence exists of a previous bite or poor temperament, the so-called one free bite rule. The question must be asked, is this law fit for purpose? The legislation must provide much more consistent outcomes for victims. I welcome a post-legislative review of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act, including the degree to which the Act is being effectively enforced by local authorities. A review should also give us the opportunity to look at other factors and try to prevent such attacks. In my constituency, we continue to face serious problems relating to puppy farming, particularly at the Port of Cairn Ryan. Researchers from Newcastle University has shown that dog bred Dogs bred on intensive puppy farms grow up to be more aggressive, 
fearful and anxious pets than from reputable breeders. The result of this study, coupled with the worrying increase in the number of puppies farmed, producing large numbers of dogs for sale, require that we must ensure that all dogs are properly cared for and owners are aware of the responsibilities, not only to their pets, but to other members of the community. Deputy Presiding Officer, finally, I'd like to mention the current Take a Lead campaign being led by the NFU Scotland and Scottish Farmer, a campaign to pressure the Scottish Government to review legislation around responsible dog ownership and support the mandatory use of leads around livestock. Despite, I, sorry, I don't really have time. Despite a demonstration of cross-party support for the campaign, the Scottish Government says it has no plans to review the law. And it's somewhat disappointing, but not surprising that Emma Harper, the PLO to Fergus Shewing, who originally backed the campaign, has now backed off and supports the far from satisfactory postcode lottery option of additional local authority by law powers. When the council is already hard pressed and currently failing to issue existing control, uh, dog control notices under uh, the current legislation, we need a national solution for a national problem. I hope that Alec Neil's members' debate tonight will put this issue very much in the spotlight and ensure that the protection is there for our workers, our in individuals, and other animals from dog attacks that have become too common, too common place in our society. I have Kenneth Gibson, followed by Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, I'd first like to congratulate my colleague Alec Neil on securing this debate and also Clyde News for the Lead the Way campaign and their investigation into the worrying extent of dog attacks. And much of the drive to secure this debate has come from the Communication Workers' Union, which among its 200,000 members counts 8,500 Royal Mail and Parcel Force employees in Scotland. Most posties could tell you about a recent near miss with a dog or about mail that has gone undelivered because of concerns regarding a dangerous animal. Last year alone, there were 230 reported dog attacks on postal workers in Scotland. I myself received 22 stitches in a rather tender part of my anatomy back in 1992 whilst delivering leaflets for the cause. Two other activists I know have been hospitalised after being bitten. And of course, we've all seen in the media some truly awful uh, pictures of young uh, children who have been attacked, mauled, and in some cases, uh, uh, the attacks have proven fatal through dog attacks. Nobody deserves to work or fear of being attacked by an animal. Those who are unfortunately attacked should feel confident that the police and justice system will listen to them and act to ensure it doesn't happen again. Given concerns raised by the CWU regarding impunity for owners of dangerous dogs, coupled with the rising number of dog attacks revealed by Clyde News, we must ask ourselves, does the Dangerous Dogs Act go far enough? And already tonight we've heard it doesn't. When a dog attack is reported, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service consider the facts and circumstances to assess whether or not there is sufficient evidence to prosecute and if so, whether action would be in the public interest. Dog attacks are covered under Section 3 of the Dangerous Dog Act 1991, which defines a dog as being dangerously out of control, and I quote, on an occasion on which there are grounds for reasonable apprehension that it will injure any person or assistance dog, whether or not it actually does so, close quote. For prosecution to occur, the Crown must prove there were such grounds at the relevant time. An actual injury is not essential, though an aggravating factor. In reality, this means that if there is no evidence the person in charge of the dog at the time of the attack believed it would attack, the Crown cannot prosecute. The Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010 gave new powers to local authorities to act against out-of-control dogs and enforce measures to improve behaviour. However, in most cases, councils aim to work with dog owners and informally resolve any issues, giving appropriate advice and guidance, and issuing a warning letter rather than a dog control notice to escalate the matter further. Well, I agree that there is a time and a place for constructive discussions with dog owners on how to handle their dogs better, with at least 2,500 postal workers attacked in Scotland since the Control of Dogs Act was passed. Scotland requires a more decisive mechanism to secure justice for people attacked. Irresponsible dog ownership does not just affect humans, of course. Between 31st of March and 23rd of April this year, around 20 ewes and their unborn lambs were killed by dogs on farmland near Skermley in my constituency. Not only do these attacks have a financial and emotional impact on the farmer, they also cause immense and needless suffering to the animals. Such, degs, such deaths are easily avoidable if dog owners do not place their dogs in situations where they may cause harm or upset. Responsible dog owners do keep their animals under control and look for early signs of aggression. It's not a dog's fault if their owner doesn't take heed that they feel threatened or territorial. Presiding officer, 
Dog owners should ensure their dog is under control when the post arrives, especially if a door must be opened to sign for mail or a parcel. If a dog has a tendency to grab the mail as it arrives through a litter box, installing a wire basket on the inside of the door not only protects mail, but most importantly, the postman or woman's fingers. Scotland's postal workers do an excellent job, and it's right that all who benefit from their services should keep them out of harm's way. This problem cannot be solved by the government or local authorities working in isolation. Only with a collaborative and concerted effort to change attitudes in favour of responsible dog ownership and accountability and a tightening up of legislation can we reverse the trend of rising dog attack figures. Liam Kerr, followed by Claire Hawkey. Deputy Presiding Officer, and thanks to Alex Neil for securing this debate. It is not before time. I hadn't actually intended speaking today, but I got the briefing through from the Communication Workers Union, and it made me recall some of my own experiences. It reminded me that all of us, without exception, are here because we and an army of committed volunteers dutifully get out and deliver leaflets and information. And I suspect many of us and those volunteers have nearly had our hands taken off when doing so. Kenny Gibson just told us about his own experience. I came really close about six months ago, but fortunately, because of an early experience, I wear leather gloves. The dog got a mouthful of leather and I got away with a few scratches. But so many of our postmen and women in particular are not so lucky. And while I remember the 2016 Holyrood election, when on one of our campaign days, a veteran stalwart turned up, unusually without his wife. On questioning this, I discovered the week before she had posted something and a dog had grabbed her hand in the letterbox and sliced her open. Hospital, injections, operations and rehabilitation were to follow. And I remember this at the time because I was furious. What can be done? I said, well, not really anything came the response. I've seen it a thousand times. You've just got to deal with it. And he told me briefly about this one free bite rule, the idea that uniquely in Scotland, because you need to prove the person in charge believed the dog would attack and the dog has previous, the first attack is unlikely to secure a conviction. If it's very brief, please. Christine Graham. The member is not the first person to refer to the one uh, in three bites. That is not under the control of Dogs Scotland Act. Let me clarify that. There is no such uh, rule under that act. That act is a preemptive strike against any dog that's out of control long before it gets into the biting stage. Liam Kerr. Yes, I understand that and thank you for the clarification. But we also have to look at the fact that a private prosecution in Scotland appears to be very challenging. And this I don't understand because if the test for a criminal prosecution is more complex in Scotland, then oughtn't it to be easier to at least run a civil action? Not more difficult, apparently, than the rest of the UK, where, according to the CWU, it is a straightforward process. Now, look, posting things through your letterbox is something that happens all the time, be it pizza flyers, a church magazine, a political pamphlet, or a professional postal operation. In the rest of the UK, the onus is on the owner of the dog to take steps to ensure the dog won't attack people. So if you've got a dog that might get excited by the post, put a cage on the back of the letterbox, like Kenny Gibson said. Keep it out of the part of the house. It'd have to be very brief. <laughs> Go ahead. Fulton McGregor. I thank the member for that. I've been hearing the, the debate tonight and Alex Neil and Kenny Gibson particularly talking about the postal workers and, and now Liam Kerr. And um, I, I just wanted to put um, to say that my future father-in-law was, uh, was one of those postal workers who was attacked last year. And he talked quite a lot about the, the psychological effects. Does the member think that um, the, the Royal Mail and other employers has got a role to play in, in treating psychological effects? I can give you a wee bit extra time, Mr Kerr. You've been very, very good. Thank you, <laughs> President Officer. Um, so the question is, does the Royal Mail have a role in treating the psychological effects? Well, I certainly think it's worth looking at, but I think what the member has done very importantly is highlight the psychological effects of these dog attacks, which I think has been clear from the evidence and indeed the debate tonight, just how uh, considerable those psychological impacts will be. Uh, but look, briefly, whilst I was jotting down some notes for today, I look back at the figures that Mr Neil has put in the motion, particularly in relation to children being bitten. And then I got the absolutely heartbreaking briefing about the children being injured in dog attacks. Now, around a year ago, I took my young family to Tyrebagger, which is near Inverurie. According to its website, this is the place to enjoy the grandeur and peace of a mature forest, with specific routes designed for toddlers and buggies, with cycling and horse riding. It is excellent, and it is a wonderful place to spend the day. But... This day, I was struck as we walked around by the number of excited dogs on the loose, barking, bounding, play fighting, jumping up, getting my jeans dirty. It's intimidating enough for a five-year-old, but even worse when one starts stalking her. 
It crouched, growling, about 18 feet behind her and ban began padding towards her. Then it broke wide to get her from a side that I wasn't on. Now I picked her up and we waited until it went past. And shortly after, as the owners went past, they chuckled and said, don't mind him, he's only playing, he always does that. Does he indeed? And how often does he have to do it before my daughter, anyone else's daughter, ends up in one of those briefings that we've got? It is irresponsible, inappropriate, and inconsiderate. If owners won't voluntarily control their dogs, whether in the home or outside, they need to be compelled. So Alex Neal's motion is absolutely spot on calling this debate. The statistics are terrifying. And it's clear from the briefings, today's contributions, and bitter experience that something isn't working. The sooner his call for a review and more robust le legislation is heeded, the better. Thank you. Uh, before I call Ms Hockey, due to the number of members who still wish to speak in this debate, I will accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3. That would extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I now invite Pre Alex Neil. Presiding officer, I'm happy to move such a motion. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is... Did, did I hear a no there? <laughs> okay, that is therefore agreed. And I call Claire Hawkey to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. And I'd also uh, like to uh, congratulate Alec Neil for securing today's debate. Presiding Officer, Scotland truly is a country of dog lovers. The food, Pet Food Manufacturing Association estimates that around 471,000 households in Scotland own at least one dog in 2017. However, our love of animals cannot and should not stop us from taking measures to protect the safety of the public from the most dangerous. Be it workers who are attacked by dogs, people in their homes or kids at the park, it's incre an incredibly serious issue which many perceive is not being treated as seriously as it should be. I too would like to add my thanks to the Communication Workers' Union for their briefings uh, to prepare for today's debate. And I wish to quote a sentence which they used, which I fully agree with. Sadly, the cartoon caricatures and jokes about dogs biting postmen still prevail. But in reality, nothing could be further from the truth as the terrifying attacks result in serious physical and psychological injuries, some of which are life-changing and full recovery is never achieved. Presiding officer, workers like postmen and delivery drivers are understandably often worried about their safety. However, from my conversations with constituents, many of them are worried about dog attacks whilst enjoying local green places. Over the, la the last 18 months, I've been working very closely with friends of the Calder from Blantyre in my constituency of Rutherglen. Dr Susan Lindner Kelly from the group contacted me highlighting instances where members of the public, including children as young as three, had been left shaken after dogs had run towards them in a number of Blantyre parks. Several of the incidents which were reported to the Friends of the Calder occurred when a dog was being walked by a professional dog walker and often went off the lead. At least one of these incidents resulted in someone being bitten. Presiding officer, I fully understand Alec Neil's position in calling for a post-legislative review of the Control of Dogs Act. However, I also hope that the regulation or licensing of professional dog walkers could perhaps be considered too. Following on from the concerns raised with me, last year I sent a freedom of information request to every local authority in Scotland to ascertain the number of complaints made to them about professional dog walkers and whether their conduct had been investigated by the Council. Of the 25 authorities who responded to my FOI requests, nine of them noted that they had received at least one complaint in the last five years. However, unfortunately, many councils, including my own of South Lanarkshire, were unable to disclose the information either due to cost or the way that the information is recorded. As such, I believe we don't know the true extent of the problems faced across Scotland regarding professional dog walkers and whether the experiences of the Friends of the Calder are unique. Presiding officer, as is the case with the vast majority of individual dog owners, the vast majority of professional dog walkers conduct their business in a responsible and ethical way. However, as evidenced in Blantyre, even though these dogs aren't frequently attacking people, they are still causing many fear and alarm. The Control of Dogs Act set, sent out a clear message that the actions of irresponsible owners would not be tolerated and that there would be serious consequences should they flout the law. 
However, eight years have passed and dog attacks are sadly still occurring. My hope is that we send out an even louder message by seeing how we can not only better prosecute in instances of violent dog attacks, but by, by reducing their frequency and the risk in the first place. Joanne Lamont, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate Alec Neil both on securing this debate and the way in which he highlighted and clarified precisely why this debate is important and we do need action and I look forward to the Minister's um, response to the debate. I also want to thank CWU for its briefing, but also its persistence as a union ensuring it stands up for its members. When you think about um, dogs and the threat of um, attack, any one of us in here who's been, as Red said, campaigning, leafleting, canvassing, immediately has empathy for those who do this job day and daily. How many of us have gone out and said, who would be a postie after our um, most recent experience of a dog sighing behind the door just as the leaflet goes in? And also as a mother, I can remember wrestling with how I would make sure that my child was comfortable around dogs, not fearful and unnecessarily scared of them because a dog can be such a great companion, but also really frightened that a dog might attack the child. And I think families very often wrestle with that too. So there is empathy um, and a concern about this issue, but also how hard it must be as a hostie who does suffer these kind of attacks to discover that really, in large part, we still regard it as a music hall joke. Something has already been said, a cartoon of the postie being chased by the dog. And I have no doubt in real life there are those who find it amusing to have their dogs set upon others and enjoy seeing that kind of fear. And that in itself is something as a society we have to address. We know it's an increasing problem for postal workers because of the nature of postal services changing. More likely there has to be face-to-face -face contact with homeowners in order to get signatures. So this is an, a growing and serious issue. And indeed, in, in the briefing, we have been informed that 2,500 postal workers have been attacked since the Control of Dogs Scotland Act was implemented. That is simply not good enough. It's no longer something that's um, a side issue, but it should actually be central to um, the thinking, I think, of the government around animal welfare and safety. Pet welfare is important too. We recognise that sometimes animals are left in circumstances which make them aggressive and dangerous. We have to have a focus on responsible ownership. It is important that dogs are not put in a position where they don't know how to behave and then we have to have enforcement. But we should be absolutely clear that the issue of culpability is one thing, but the people who are certainly not to blame are the victims themselves. This is not something that we can just simply move on. In the petitions committee which I convene, we have been doing some work around the whole question of puppy farms. And what strikes me is the extent to which dogs have been commodified. They become accessories. They're not treated and cared and trained for necessarily in the way that they should. And I think the context of attacks by dogs should be placed in that broader context and any review should reflect on how we might deal with those matters as well. We have to be concerned, as CWU, do hi CWU highlights, that it's more difficult to get a conviction in Scotland than elsewhere. And while there has been a debate about the implications or the reality of the one free bite rule, I've certainly been told by the CWU that that is a fact and a, a matter that has to be dealt with. And perhaps the review would look at where the legislation would need to be changed in order to address that question. I was also struck by the number of ideas from CWU and others about making sure uh, dog owners are more uh, responsible. But I want to just finish really um, in this last minute, seconds that I've got, is to urge the Minister in her review to confirm that she is willing to review the, the dog control legislation in its broader context, to look at enforcement and to understand it may not be satisfactory to have enforcement at a local level, it may be there needs to be something at a national level too. And I would also seek a confirmation from her that when she does review this work, she will look with at the charities in, in the sector, but critically with the CWU and others who have a direct responsibility for their members. Liz Smith, followed by Colin Beatty. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I add my own congratulations to Alec Neil, not only for bringing the debate, but for his uh, articulate uh, speech this evening, uh, but also to all other members who I think have made some extremely salient uh, points 
in what has to be done. Uh, and can I add myself to the list of MSPs who have uh, suffered an attack from a dog, but in my case, what has been much worse was my witnessing uh, of a councillor colleague who was really savaged by a dog which uh, had her in hospital for some time and who has been scarred for life as a result. So I cannot stress how important this issue is. But I want, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, in the very short time that I have, to focus my remarks on what uncontrolled dogs can mean for a rural community like mine. And it is particularly relevant just now because of the growing incidence of sheep worrying in both Perthshire and Fife. Members will have seen this uh, issue reported in the press. Farmers who have lost thousands of pounds of livestock because a dog has been allowed to run riot in a field of ewes and lambs. And it's too upsetting for me to describe uh, what I was asked to witness by a constituent who rang me to look at the result of a recent attack um, and in terms of what I had to see in that field. It was awful. In Fife, I have noticed reports of a farmer who had to endure two such attacks on farm animals in the space of only 36 hours, resulting in £12,000 of damage. That, Deputy Presiding Officer, is somebody's livelihood. The rural statistics make for shocking reading too. Last year across Scotland, there were 175 reported cases of sheep worrying, but only 19 convictions. And in Perthshire, there were 14 cases last year and no convictions. And the most recent attack that took place just last week in Colts, um, it, I think it was Monday or Tuesday last week, which resulted in uh, one sheep being found dead and another being put down due to the severity of his injuries. On the 15th of April, a dog was shot by a farmer. Legal right to do that, but in the Fortivia area of Perthshire, this was after persistent uh, worrying of his flock. A few days before that, on the 13th of April, another ewe in the Glen Craig area was put down after it was found that they had seriously injured um, a whole lot of uh, lambs in a field. And it goes on. And at the meeting of the local Perthshire NFUS just on Friday, this whole issue was debated in full. And so I was able to uh, brief the members on the discussions that I've been having with local police about this, who are very concerned naturally, and the representatives uh, from other aspects of the farming community. And I very much hope that we will uh, shortly be afforded a meeting with the Minister Fergus Ewing, who I know is genuinely very concerned about this. Because it, it cannot go on. We need much tighter controls in place, and I think uh, Claire Hockey is absolutely right to raise the possibility of looking at um, other issues. Um, we need to raise public awareness of what's been happening across the countryside, and I think farmers are virtually unanimous in their view that they want to see a very full debate about the respective merits of licensing, microchipping, and DNA sampling in order to help police convict the guilty parties. And it's also been said that we need to review the Scottish Outdoor Access Code because it has too many loopholes within it, allowing irresponsible walkers and ramblers to get away with it. Personally, I think that that cannot come soon enough. In my most recent trips into the Scottish hills and mountains, I have seen two clear examples of highly irresponsible behaviour by dog owners, one of which uh, replicates what Liam Kerr said, but which could have resulted very high on the hill uh, if anything had happened, mountain rescue as well. So there is a big job to be done to educate the public and raise awareness of just what can happen when dogs are not properly controlled. Deputy Presiding Officer, we've heard already of the untold damage that can be done to humans, and Alex Neil is absolutely right to pursue this. I do urge, however, that measures include those to address the concerns in the countryside and the awful implications for the livelihoods of those affected. I do firmly believe that we need a very full debate on this whole issue. Thank you. The last two speakers in the open debate are Colin Beatty to be followed by John Scott. Presiding officer, let me first thank Alec Neil for securing this very important debate. In my constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh, I've been made all too aware of the prevalence of dog attacks, both on residents and on other dogs. I've had a number of constituents come forward to tell me their stories and some of what they describe is horrific. Out of control dogs attacking other dogs, sometimes with fatal results, dreadful injuries to other dogs, which require surgery and could be life changing for the victim dog. While most often I hear of injuries sustained by pet animals, there are also a significant number of human beings being injured, often while trying to save their much loved pet from harm. One such lady suffered permanent nerve injuries to her hand when she was savaged by an attacking dog. Now she's afraid to go into parks with her dog for fear of attack. She's not alone. Many human victims of dog attacks suffer psychological trauma as a result of unprovoked attack. When I talk of life-changing injuries, they're not all physical. 
Another recent case has come to me where a lady was forced to watch her well-loved pet dog being literally torn apart by a Rottweiler. One can only imagine the distress and lasting grief caused by such an attack. In Midlothian, I've had discussions with the police and the council, and it's clear that such attacks are underreported, in part due to confusion on the part of the, of the public where to actually report incidents, and which incidents require reporting to the police and which to the council. The, simple sh the, the, the system should be much simpler. Members of the public should not have to work out the nuances of whether this is a police matter or a dog control matter for the council. A dangerous dog is a dangerous dog. I've seen material from the Communication Workers Union in respect to attacks on postal workers, and some of the photographs of the injuries sustained drive home the enormity of the problem. The CWU tells us that 220 postal workers were attacked and injured by dogs in the past year, and that's quite simply unacceptable. In Bonnyrigg, there's a community group called Bright Sparks, located beside George V Park. They cater for some 160 children with additional support needs. They cannot make use of the park because the children are absolutely terrified of uncontrolled, aggressive dogs in the park. Instead, they remain safe behind secure high-wire fences in their play area. Is it really acceptable that it's our children who are in cages and not the creatures who cause such fear? Irresponsible professional dog walkers who sometimes bring six or seven dogs to the park and then simply let them loose are a significant part of the problem. Not just from the dogs running wild, but from the antisocial behavior in allowing dog poo to pollute our parks. The problems again confined to a small number of professional dog walkers whose standards are unacceptable. On a more personal note, I myself have noted when knocking on doors at election time, firstly, the number of people who have dogs, and secondly, the number of dogs which exhibit aggressive tendencies. Now, it may seem they have a down on dogs, but that's far from the truth. The vast majority of dog owners are responsible people whose well cared for pets will never cause the slightest problem. But we have to acknowledge that a small number of owners are causing serious issues within our communities, and that cannot continue. I have received many suggestions which, which is belie it believes might help control the unsocialized minority while enabling decent dog owners and their pets to continue to enjoy their lives together. Among those suggestions are bringing back a dog licensing scheme which would allow irresponsible dog owners to be deprived of the right to own the pets which they abuse, license, license the professional dog walkers. Again, this would enable licenses to be removed from those who fail to maintain reasonable standards. Compulsory pet insurance so that victims of attacks can seek compensation. Now, I'm uncertain whether the current deplorable situation has arisen due to present legislation being inadequate to provide the protection required, or indeed if present legislation is perfectly adequate, but the police and councils need to be more robust in making use of the powers which they have. Either way, either way, there is action to be taken. My inclination would be to agree with the Communication Workers Union that for a start, there should be post-legislative scrutiny of the Control of Dogs Act 2010. Only by doing so will we be able to assess how effective this act is. Presiding officer, there is a real problem which is growing along with the expansion of dog ownership. And we cannot stand by while residents of this country and their pets are being injured. That would indeed be irresponsible. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'll endeavour to be brief. And can I also congratulate Alec Neal in bringing forward uh, this motion today. I agree completely with him that the Act is not working. I agree that the rising number of attacks on people and children is despairing and often disfiguring, or indeed much worse. I agree that a review of the 2010 Act needs to take place and the powers available to the authority to prevent this. I also have concerns about dog and dog attacks and a small dog was recently destroyed by a larger one in my constituency. However, the point I want to make is with regard to sheep worrying by dogs not under control. I need to declare an interest here as a, as a farmer and my sheep flock have twice been subject to attack by dogs. This resulted in many in lamb ewes being killed or almost worse having to be put down some hours after the attack as the in lamb ewes in a vet's view, were unlikely to survive. And this was a significant loss to my business as the sheep were not insured. In addition, many other ewes in the flocks aborted their lambs subsequently after the attacks as a result of the stress and exertion these heavily pregnant ewes had to endure. So like Finlay Carson, I support the Scottish farmer and the NAFU's campaign take a lead. And I too would invite the government to consider reviewing the legislation in place and invite the strengthening of the legislation with regard particularly to sheep worrying. Of course, 
Uh, Christine I'm, Graham. I'm not being precious about the legislation, but the Scottish Farmers magazine had no idea about the Control of Dogs Act. So I'm back to the position where there's no publicity to the, N SF, uh, uh, the Scottish uh, NFU or to the Scottish Farmer about this. I completely share his concerns, but we must get publicity for this act as well as review perhaps the content. John Scott. I thank Christine Grain for her well-intentioned intervention, I'm sure. Nonetheless, the campaign has been mounted by both of these organisations in good faith. They have presented us with a problem and it's up to us as politicians and indeed government to resolve. And I'm sure you will do all you can to put pressure on your party to come to a satisfactory resolution, if at all possible. And like Kenny Gibson, while I had forgotten, my own dog bites, I too, uh, bear the scars. Uh, finally, I too make uh, this plea for better control of dangerous dogs on behalf of our dedicated postmen, particularly in Air constituency, who all know where the biting dogs are on their own walks and support the CWU's position on this. Presiding officer, the time for talking and collecting data is long past. It's now time for the governments of all colours to act. Thank you. I call on Annabel Ewing to conclude this debate uh, for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to begin by congratulating Alex Neil on securing this evening's members' debate. And it is indeed appropriate to reiterate that it was, of course, Alex Neil who embarked on the process that led to the Control of Dogs Act being passed by this Parliament back in 2010. And as we have heard, Alex Neil, uh, in fact, brought forward the original members' bill proposal uh, before other uh, uh, events uh, intervened, and then Christine Graham took up the baton uh, and uh, brought the legislation to the Parliament, uh, and the Parliament indeed duly passed the dog control notice regime. And I pay tribute to both of them for their hard work and perseverance in ensuring that this issue was brought before the Parliament and in securing, uh, through the members' bill process, uh, a legislative route uh, to that uh, end. The Control of Dogs Act gave new powers to local authorities to deal with the issue of irresponsible dog ownership. And the focus of this legislation, as has been mentioned, was indeed deed and not breed. And it did this by moving away from an outdated understanding that certain breeds of dog were inherently more dangerous than others, and instead correctly focused on the actions of dog owners in controlling their own dogs. Of course, I, I think it has been recognised that the vast majority of uh, dog owners are indeed responsible and uh, enjoy the companionship of, of having a dog and indeed the outdoor activity that having a dog, I understand, uh, brings to your life. I don't have a dog, but I see many people being dragged out for walks at uh, all times of the day and night, which is, of course, a healthy uh, 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 option for them. But, of course, there is a minority, uh, a small minority of dog owners who fail to understand uh, their responsibilities that come with owning a dog, caring for the dog, looking after the dog, and indeed making sure that others, both uh, human and animals, are safe around their dogs. The powers given to local authorities under the legislation mean that dog control notices can be used against dog owners who allow their dogs to be out of control. And it is indeed for local authority authorised officers, and of course the number of such officers in each local authority is a matter for that local authority, but for these authorised officers to use these powers to help protect uh, our communities from out of control dogs. The most recent evidence shows that as a whole, local authorities are using these powers uh, more and more each year. And in the latest year for which we have statistics on this, that is the year February 2015 to February 2016, a record number of dog control notices were issued across Scotland, that is to say 290 notices. However, what is also uh, clear from the data uh, on the use of the Act is that, as has been mentioned, there is a wide variation in the use of these powers by local authorities. Uh, and I think it would be fair to say, at least to a certain extent, that that variation will uh, reflect the way in which the legislation is to be designed to be used. And as Christine Graham alluded, indeed it is a preventative regime seeking to resolve dog control issues before a dog actually becomes dangerous. Some local authorities, therefore, will not necessarily proceed to issue uh, dog control notices in every uh, case, but instead will engage with owners and give them advice on keeping their dogs under control. The 20... Certainly. Johan Lamont. I wonder if the Minister has had a discussion with local authorities about why there is this vari variation. You speculate that it might be because they're doing one thing or another. I think we'd want a reassurance that if they're not... Um, 
putting out notice they are doing something else, and I think it's that rigour around us that we're asking for. There may not be a national solution, but there certainly has to be a national conversation. Annabelle Ewing. Well, I entirely agree with, with that remark from Joanne Lamont, which is why I will be writing to each, local, or each of the 32 local authorities to seek from them an update as to what exactly they do further to this legislation. I think it's important, indeed, that we have that uh, information in order that we can determine uh, uh, what, how best to proceed. So the 2010 Act also made a significant change uh, to how the long-standing criminal offence in relation to dangerous dogs operated. The change made meant that dogs uh, dangerously out of control in private places such as the home were brought within the scope of the Act. And this development was very important for our uh, essential postal workers uh, and indeed this legislative change was welcomed by postal workers and further to the comments I think from most members tonight about the CWU uh, letter to us all I, I can say to members that I will be seeking a meeting with the CWU to discuss in more detail uh, their uh, particular concerns and suggestions. Um, in this session of Parliament um, Members will, of course, be aware that there is a renewed focus on post-legislative scrutiny with the creation of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. And I can say on behalf of the government that uh, if the Public Audit Committee were to decide to look into the operation of the 2010 Act, then we would certainly be very happy to be involved in that. Uh, I, of course, the Act has been, as has been mentioned, in force since February 2011. And so a number of years of experience in operation could be indeed usefully assessed by that committee of this uh, parliament. Uh, and uh, as I said also, uh, we uh, did very much support at the time the ethos of the legislation proposed by Alex Neal and then Christine uh, Graham. Uh, and we felt that looking at rather the behavior of the dog owner uh, uh, was the key uh, 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 element of uh, ensuring that we tackled this problem of out of control dogs for in the end of the day it's not the dog's fault if the dog is out of control it's the owner's fault if the dog is out of control and that is an important point to bear in mind I think it would be helpful also to remind members that um, just to, to look at wider issues here that the government did in fact undertake a consultation on other possible steps in 2013 including seeking views on introducing dog licensing or dog muzzling there were mixed views offered on dog licensing with the majority of those who offered a view against reintroducing such a system. And I can say that there was in fact overwhelming opposition to the introduction of mandatory uh, muzzling. However, what was clear from this consultation exercise was the importance of this preventative approach as set forth in the 2010 Act, certainly. Liz Smith. Uh, no, no, you can't just shout, Miss Smith, because <laughs> we need the microphones for the official report. <laughs> Much as I know you would be capable of reaching the far reaches Apolo of the chamber. Apolo apologies, Deputy President <laughs> Officer. Would the Minister accept nonetheless that despite the evidence about the licensing issue, that there is new technology now, there's microchipping, that this, this is a very important issue about um, using technology to control uh, dogs and the responsibility of the owners. It's not just about licensing, it's about use of DNA, it's about use of uh, the microchip. Would you agree to look at that? Annabelle Ewing. Well, certainly, obviously, technology has moved on, but I just wanted to emphasize to members that the idea that dog licensing is some sort of panacea is not shared by members of the public who actually didn't support that uh, approach. Uh, in terms of uh, situations where a, a dog control notice is issued, then there is mandatory uh, microchipping. Uh, involved. Uh, in terms of the important issue of livestock worrying that has been raised by a number of members, uh, of course, um, local authorities do actually have existing powers to uh, issue uh, dog control notices to dogs deemed out of control, and that obviously includes dogs out of control as far as livestock worrying is concerned. And indeed, uh, there are local council bylaws uh, in place which can uh, allow uh, legislation to enforce the use of leads. Uh, in areas where dogs, uh, control of dogs has been an issue. Obviously, we keep all uh, important matters under review, and I would say to Liz Smith that I'd be happy to ensure uh, that the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Rural Economy, uh, that his attention is drawn to the debate tonight, because, of course, many key pertinent points were raised uh, on that very, very important issue of livestock uh, worrying. 
Uh, I think, uh, in conclusion, I see I'm over my time, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I think it is uh, fair to say that we've had a very good debate tonight. A lot of uh, very important issues were raised, uh, a lot of uh, concrete ideas were raised. Uh, and uh, what I would say again is that it would appear to me that we have uh, uh, created this opportunity through the parliamentary committee process to engage in post-legislative scrutiny of appropriate legislation. It would appear to me that this uh, uh, legislation, the 2010 Act, may be ripe for such scrutiny by our Parliament's uh, Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. So I do hope that that committee may reflect on the very important debate tonight uh, and we will ensure that their attention is drawn to the comments of all members in this debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.